great. Could you show a somersault right now? Low Earth orbit is between 99 miles and 1200 miles away. The moon is claimed to be 238,000 miles away. That's a big difference. This is the spacecraft that's going to take humans to explore uh, the solar system. It's the next big step for NASA in exploration. Called the Orion Multipurpose Crew Vehicle, or MPCV, this next generation spacecraft will enable America to explore beyond low Earth orbit. The plan that NASA has is to build a rocket called SLS, which is a heavy lift rocket. It's something that is, that is much bigger than what we have today, and it will be able to launch the Orion capsule with humans on board, as well as uh, landers or other uh, components to, via, to destinations beyond Earth orbit. Right now, we only can fly in Earth orbit. That's the farthest that we can go. Right now, we only can fly in Earth orbit. That's the farthest that we can go. And this new system that we're building is gonna allow us to go beyond and hopefully take humans into the solar system to explore. So the moon, Mars, asteroids, there's a lot of destinations that we could go to and we're building these building block components in order to allow us to do that eventually. The moon, Mars, the, the moon, the moon, the moon. The kinds of technologies that we're testing out on space station are definitely helping us with our goals of going beyond low Earth orbit, our goals of going beyond low Earth orbit. A set of crewed flights will test and prove the systems required for exploration beyond low Earth orbit. It was all recorded on these telemetry tapes. So where is this hard evidence? I haven't uh, seen anything that indicates the telemetry data is even in existence. And as I said, even if we had it, we don't have the machines to play it back. But your, you, your own research has shown the telemetry data is missing. That's, that's right. Could this be true? Mankind's first interplanetary exploration and the original science data is missing? If it's anywhere, it should be here at NASA's Goddard Space Center in Maryland, home to the National Space Science Data Archives. This film you're making now, what is it? This is um, this is a film trying to prove that Apollo 11 happened. Uh, does it have a name? I mean, do you have you have a name for it yet, I think or are you? Calling it Did We Go? Did We Go? Okay, okay. Doesn't have it either. The Smithsonian right. doesn't have it. Right. Johnson doesn't right. have it. Right. 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 We we've been unable to. to to track it down. I mean, we don't know uh, where this this telemetry data ended up, and we don't know the what what path it may have taken. So, <laughs> unfortunately, I'm afraid I can't really give you much of a clue as to as to where this data ended up and whether it, it still exists or not. A closer look at the supposed two images provided from NASA of Jupiter. Here's the problem again, 2016, 2014. What's the difference here? What well, difference is they added the supposed auroras on the north. And this is nothing but a Christmas tree. Give me a break, take a look here. I mean, all the clouds are in the same exact position. Just the 2016 image is a bit would say darker is a bit lighter in 2014 here's a side by side people can't see what's taking place here with nasa nothing more than fakery i mean give me a break this is, this is a complete insult 
you have a brain in your head. So I keep digging a little bit deeper and I finally get underneath this cloud cover here and a few images pop up. And I say, oh, images, what are they? Well, this is what you got, which I'm sure that looks familiar to you, right? Looks just like the pictures they give us of Mars. So I'm just kind of creeping around here and definitely noticing the same kind of undulation changes and same kind of rock, same kind of dirt. The only thing that's missing is that nice little red tint that they, they pay somebody $150,000 a year to put on there. Right. Um, who's orange hummer, hummer is this? Okay, that looks like a NASA system. Well, let's dig a little further because I can't really see anything on here other than it certainly looks like a NASA symbol. And I can't read that, tried. Cameras set up, tents, ATVs, food. They've been there a while. It's not a one day trip is set up out in the middle of nowhere in Greenland. Another ATV, a leveling, a leveler equipment. So I'll keep kind of going through here and see if it. What the? Uh. Yeah. So. Um, I think I found out where Mars is, guys. It's just uh, about a thousand miles north of me. Not quite the distance that NASA says. But I can't find anybody who's in charge of this. They must be hiding behind these rocks. Oh no, there they are out in front of everybody just standing there. Lovely. Clown number one, clown number two, clown number three. This thing's just driving around taking pictures. Job is it's primarily taking data and making pictures out of it. That's what this is. A composite of data sets from several different instruments translated into a picture. On. It is photoshopped, but it's it's has to be. Then there was another layer to sort of simulate the atmosphere. And then there's this little bright spot. It's called the specular highlight. So it's the reflection of sunlight off of water. Those are the pieces, but you can't just slap them all together. It just didn't look realistic. It looks kind of flat, looks kind of flat, looks kind of flat, or the clouds are sort of too see-through. So I just take Command-Z a lot. There's artistry to creating the world. English in, in reading too much, but I've since grown out of that and I enjoy reading now. And I played a lot of sports. And all of that happened in a little town called York, Maine, across the United States from where we're talking to you right now. <laughs> across the United States from where we're talking to you right now. Across the United States from where we're talking to you right now. <laughs> and let's enlist the help of a friend. Taxi. You might know her. Ladies and gentlemen, if you didn't figure out by now, I'm going to be the first man to actually tell you this, that teleportation is officially real. We are live in the ISS and let's go back and relook at that clip again. You see? Now watch. Oh, wait, wait, wait. See? This, ladies and gentlemen, should let you know that this is only done through the usage of chroma key. This is chroma key technology, this is green screen or blue screen technology, that's what is being utilized here. This is simply virtual reality that is actually being fed to you and you're taking this virtual reality, making it the reality. When in fact all this is is simply just virtual CGI, computer generated images. So you decide for yourself, 
if we have the technology to build the space station and have people go and live in the space station for months and months at a time and they are there constantly reporting back to earth the things that they are finding there then the question is why go through all this trouble as far as faking the space station itself why go through the trouble of faking these people in space who are supposed to be the astronauts who are in space and have their arms disappear from the screen just like that why have that why go through all that trouble so this video is an astronaut explaining the mission it's not like practice footage or anything watch closely arrangement are uh, Dan sat in the pilot seat during this operation uh, sort of monitoring the uh, motion of the vehicle making sure that it was steady and that the, uh, the you know there were very few uh, vibrations of any sort this is a picture of the insat uh, actually being deployed from the uh, spacecraft you can see that the, the deploy went very smoothly at the moment of did you see it in the background there was a guy in the background man <laughs> I'm not kidding you, you can't deny that that's someone in the background. There's a guy moving in the background. Here, watch it again, watch it closely. I, I looked up or I tried to look up the size of this rocket. I, I found this picture, you can see it's massive. So if that rocket is in space and if there's a guy in the background in that footage, that means that there are like giants like insane big giants floating around in space looking at nasa that's pretty that's probably why they don't dare to go back to the moon and why they hide so much stuff space is full of giants an explosion velocity 2900 feet per second altitude nine nautical miles downrange distance seven nautical miles this is not standard this is not something that is planned of course I can see a solid rocket booster has broken away from Shuttle Challenger. That's what you're looking at in the middle of your screen. I cannot see the shuttle itself. In 1986, the Shuttle Challenger exploded about 74 seconds after takeoff, killing all seven astronauts inside. Or did it? It turns out that six of the seven are still alive and kicking today. Ellison Onizuka claims to be his identical twin brother, Claude. Yeah, I've got an identical twin brother, Claude, too. The Challenger pilot, Mickey Smith, hasn't even bothered changing his name. He's now Professor Michael J. Smith of University of Wisconsin. Now, Krista McAuliffe was a bit of a sneaky one. She was the Challenger payload specialist, quite famous for being a teacher. It turns out, during her astronaut days, she was using her middle name, Krista. And now she goes by her first name, Sharon. And she's a Syracuse law professor. The Challenger commander, Francis Richard Scobie, is now Dick Scobie, which sounds like a rather unpleasant disease, a CEO of Cows in Trees Limited. Judith Resnick, the Challenger mission specialist, again hasn't even bothered changing her name. She's a professor at Yale Law. And finally, Ronald McNair, another Challenger mission specialist, claims to be his identical twin brother, Carl McNair. Ed White is flying at 17,000 miles per hour, 200 miles above the Earth. 
Okay, I'm out. If the spacesuit fails, the difference in pressure will kill him instantly. This could be a serious problem because you don't want your stop motion toy to die in space. As White floats in space, a glove drifts out of the capsule. Oh, so a garden glove floating off makes it real? You're telling me there's an astronaut in space with no glove and a bare hand exposed? And what blew it away? The wind? Today, those pictures are, are, are classic. They're still overpowering today to realize, number one, it's been done, and that we did it. It blew me away. How easy it was to deceive everyone. It was quite easy, actually. We all know NASA uses wires, and sometimes we'll catch them like this here, the guy pulled on his wire. However, some days when you're filming live, things just don't work out, and it becomes so blatantly obvious, it's ridiculous. So, in this clip, they're talking, live feed, and what you know, we have a astronaut go by us in the background, uh, obviously trying to give it a more realistic spacey station busy effect the only problem is the camera that was supposed to mask this harness out or the uh, video feed is not working and so we see the guy come flying along in a harness on his wires pretty amazing but that's not all that goes wrong here channel in 3d space it's virtual reality he's they're wearing augmented uh, contact lenses so that they can interact with these 3d objects now in this scene the guy on the left in the green shirt he thinks he sees an object in 3d space that's being broadcast to him so he grabs it and he puts it off to the side he's looking straight ahead because he's looking at an object rotating in front of him but the video channel is down that is supposed to show the viewers what we're supposed to see and so we don't actually get to see the object that he has seen and I would just sum this up as a very terrible bad horrible day for NASA doing live feeds uh, as much fun as this was there is a time coming when you and I will not be able to tell the difference
I know what you're thinking. So, NASA is fake, big deal. How does this affect me? Blah, blah, blah. Or you're thinking, no, no, there's no way my heroes could be lying to me. There's no way that this whole world is in on this big scam. This is just too much. And that's what I would have thought too. But here is what they are hiding and why NASA formed in the first place. Pay attention. Admiral Byrd, you've been to both the North Pole and the South Pole. Is there any yeah. unexplored land left on this Earth that might appeal to adventurous young Americans? Uh, yes, there is. And not up around the North Pole because it's getting crowded up there now because they find out it's really usable, not only to live in, but militarily. But strangely enough, there's left in the world today an area as big as the United States that's never been seen by a human being. And that's beyond the pole on the other side of the South Pole from Middle America. And it's, uh, I think it's quite astonishing that there should be an area as big as that unexplored. That's a tremendous So challenge. there's a lot of adventure left mm -hmm. down at the bottom of the world. A number of expeditions that will follow, I think, uh, year after year, at the bottom of the world, because the government has really become interested. I tell you one reason they're interested. It's by far the most uh, valuable, important place left in the world for science. That's why the scientific groups all over the nation are really interested. But more important than that, it's, uh, it has to do with the future uh, of the nation, those to come after us, or even uh, during your lifetime because it happens to be an untouched reservoir of natural resources. You know, as the world shrinks with an ever-increasing acceleration, far-flung places, once useless, like we thought the North Pole was, and no man's land, become very useful. Uh, the bottom of the world will be important, not only to us, but to our allies. And it's the most peaceful place in the world. Well, I'm sure that <laughs> won't last very long. Uh, <clears throat> what are the natural resources there? Well, uh, we've found enough of coal within 180 miles of the South Pole in a great uh, ridge of mountains. It's not covered with snow. Enough to supply the whole world for quite a while. Well, uh, that's, that's the coal. Now, there's evidence of uh, other, many other minerals. Uh, we are pretty sure there's oil. Now, that coal shows the bottom of the world now by far the coldest spot in the world. Where that coal is gets 100 below zero in the winter. Well, uh, it was once tropical. So uh, we think there's oil there and there's evidence, probably uranium there. Is it any secret? Is there uranium there? That would be the only thing that would be practical to uh, actually go after, I suppose. Everything else would be economically uh, unfeasible, wouldn't it? Well, as we recklessly expend our resources, the time will come when we can, we'll have to go after that stuff down there. Well, Admiral Byrd, are yeah. private expeditions a thing of the past? Is, is expedition and exploration, making expedition and exploration now a purely a government function because uh, of the tremendous no, cost organization? No, I don't think so. I think down south, it may be more or less a thing of the past, but not other, other expeditions that go, there. a lot of them go north now. The, the North Pole is the center of an ocean 10,000 feet deep. The South Pole, the center of a plateau, 10,000 feet high. 